Um, I'm here to give you a talk that is entitled Grail's Hexagonal Architecture, for reasons we'll get into. So first off, who am I? Who is this person who's talking to you? My name's David Dawson. Um, I am CEO and Principal Consultant at uh, my consultancy company, Simplicity Itself. Uh, we're based in the UK. Uh, we tend to do work mainly in the UK, um, but we're doing some work in the rest of the uh, Northern Europe, generally. Um, we do training and software development, things like that. Things that you're not really interested in being programmers. So I want to start with a question. Architecture versus design. This is not really a question, it's more of a, a statement. Um, who thinks that architecture and design are the same thing? If you were at my talk yesterday, you'll realize I asked trick questions. This is one of them. They aren't the same thing. Now, who, who does TDD, Test Driven Development? Brilliant, great. So one thing that you may have heard um, is that if you're doing TDD, your design will emerge through your tests. Now, this is, I would put it to you, false. You have to design. Design is a, is a mental process you have to go through to actually structure your code. Your tests will inform your design, but you have to actually design. They won't magically make it for you. However, this is not the same thing as architecture. Architecture is something different. Now, when you're designing your software, you have many choices, a plethora of choices, millions of choices. If I design some software, it will be different than if you were to design the same piece of software. Yeah, and so that's what people think of as architecture, is the design choices you make. Again, there are very few architectures. Just like there are as many designs as you choose to, uh, to make, your architecture, either you choose it up front from the one of very limited number, or it will be chosen for you by default. And that's what I, what, that's what I want to talk to you about today, is that, is that choice of architecture. So fundamentally, architecture is philosophy. It's a set of tools that you use to approach a problem. It is not the solution to a problem. That is your design. Your architecture is how you approach that problem. It's the thinking process you go through. Now, in Grails, there is a thinking process you go through. There's a set of tools already there for you. And I'm going to describe those and then describe a different approach. Who likes, who likes Lego? Yeah, very good. You won't hear about this again. Now, the default to Grails architecture. Who thinks that Grails has an architecture? This is, again, is a trick question. <laughs> it does. It does have one. Grails, a framework, has an architecture, and it's, and it's coherent. However, your applications have a different architecture. You may not realize it. You are already using an architecture that you will find in the documentation, you will find in pretty much any Grails application you look into. And it's one that was broadly inherited from Spring. And it is a N-tier data-centric architecture. That's what you're probably using. Now, I'll go through what this is. I'll describe it to you and then show you a different approach, which is what the title of the talk is, hexagonal. So, Greenfield. Brand new application, yeah? You as a team, a rather large team, have been asked to make a new application, Greenfield. This is what we call it in English. I don't know what you call it in Spanish. Um, but it is totally new. Nothing's been there before. You write the first code, Grails Create App, X. What you'll probably then do is start to think in tiers. So you'll have your web layer, your service layer, and your data layer. In Grails, you'll know them as controllers and views, services, and domains. These are your tiers. Tier. You'll then add some artifacts, some controllers, some services, probably a, a domain class or two. Add some more. Add some more. Add some more. Add some more, and then add some views on the front. And this is what you're probably, this is what your applications will start to look like. Broken up into tiers, yes. The connections between them, starting to get a bit hairy. You know, this is moving towards the big ball of mud architecture that you've heard so much about. 
It's hard to unpick where, where things are. What you will know, though, is that from your domains, those domains will be used all the way up the, all the, way up the stack. They'll be represented in the domain layer, in the service layer, and then finally in the controllers as well. This is the data-centric portion of the architecture. You're exposing your domain model directly to your users. So if you go with Grail's CRUD, for example, that's exposing it very directly. The, the user knows precisely what's in your database. So this is a data-centric element. Yeah, a bit more data. So this has got several issues. Um, I don't like this architecture. This actually isn't inherent in Grails. This is just what most of you will be using. And I don't like it. It's got several problems. Coupling between the tiers is the biggest one. So your controllers and your services and your domain layer are all intertwined. Picking them apart is almost impossible once you have a fairly sized large, large application. Trying to break them up, modularize, very difficult. So this coupling is, is, is a problem. Service spaghetti, stateless service spaghetti. Um, your service layer will become just abhorrent. Trying to fit, uh, work through all the different variations of, well, if I press this button on the user interface, where in the service layer does that end up? Probably everywhere. Um, that's the problems I've been having in, in cer certain applications. And I call this spaghetti. Again, this is inherited from Spring. You'll find this in Spring applications. It's uh, very much the same. Lastly, exposing your user to your data model. So if, if you ever show your user a database ID, you're doing this. Um, by default in Grails, you will be doing this. It's exposing your user directly to what's in the database. You're using your persistence as your source of truth for your application. And that leads to problems. That's what the field looks like today, by the way. <laughs> Same field. So this is the one from Windows 95. <laughs> no longer green. So I want to talk to you about architecture. So the Grails architecture is very much data centric. The database, the persistence layer, is your source of truth. And it's end tier. And you probably think this is the way you'd, this is the only way to design applications because you look around all the documentation around Grails, this is what you see but it isn't. There are other ways. So I want to show you a communication-centric architecture. Domain-based. This is different from the Grails domain. Um, I think that the Grails domain is slightly misleading in its name because a Grails domain is a persistence mechanism. Whereas we're talking about application domains. This is a, an area of the business that you're trying to replicate or trying to model. This is an area, a technical area of, of, the, of your application, breaking your application up into pieces, and I'll show you this in detail. And it's an architecture. So this communication-centric, uh, domain-based architecture, you may have already guessed, can be referred to as hexagonal. Fundamentally, I'm also going to be showing you an event architecture. Now, hexagonal architectures do not have to be event-based. I choose to make them so, for reasons you'll see. I will not be showing you any new frameworks. I will not be showing you any products. I will not be showing you any plugins. I will not be showing you anything new as far as technology goes. All I'm going to be showing you today is a series of tools, mental tools for approaching a problem, an architecture. And you then use those to create a design. First question, what are events? Be aware, I do ask trick questions. Asynchronous? Yeah? No. Very good. It's communication. Events are all about communication. They are a style of communication. Fundamentally, it's a switch from imperative to declarative. So instead of saying, go and do this, you say, this has happened. So like you say, it's a, it's a time-based thing. It's not a command. Now, switching from kind of your standard imperative um, call to a service layer and making it event-based does not mean you have to introduce asynchronous behavior into, into your application. You simply have to change the way that you talk to your service layer. 
or to any other service like, or to any other kind of part of your system. <coughs> Next, the question, what's hexagonal? I'm talking about this communication-centric, domain-based uh, architecture, calling it hexagonal. Where does this word come from? It sounds very strange. Um, I'm slightly misleading. So hexagonal, first coined by Coburn, 2005-ish, somewhere around there. And it's about separating your core logic of your application away from all of the integration points. So integration being integrating with a database, integrating with a REST layer or with, with HTTP, uh, integrate with a messaging system. All these integrations are kept separate from your core application and allow, that allows you to disconnect them. So I'm actually going to be showing you a slightly different version of this from the one that you'll see. So if you go to this URL, you'll see him writing about what he calls a ports and adapter architecture. Um, I'll be showing you something similar to what he describes, but not the same, which is what we in Simplicity itself call the life preserver approach to designing applications for reasons that will become clear. Um, this is what we refer to. So this kind of looks like, you know, like a life preserver ring that you throw to people when they're in the water. Um, that's the only reason we call it that. It was a handy name. The idea here is that you have your core application kept separate from the outside world, and you manage the way it integrates through this outer ring. And these, this then allows you to separate up your application into domains that communicate with each other in a very controlled way. So as an example, we have our core application. This is where all of your policies sit, business logic. You'll know about business logic. You'll hit. In many applications, it's kept separate. Um, in probably many more, it's smeared throughout the entire application, and it's almost impossible to pick out. But it always exists. It's always there. You will be making decisions about what happens in the system. Now, I would put it to you. Put that in one place, the core of your application, and then manage the way it integrates. So we have, say, a REST layer, maybe some eventing system, some UI, and then the database. Now, this is a difficult one. For a Grails develop developer particularly, you're taught your database is your source of truth. Now, it isn't. I, in this architecture, it certainly is not. In a data-centric architecture, it is. And that's one of the biggest switches. In this, your source of truth is your core application. So if anyone's ever done domain-driven design, um, this is the kind of model that you'll be pushed to. So, I do have an example application. Um, now, a few weeks ago, uh, we started a new project uh, with a client, and um, we apply this architecture. And so I thought I would show you kind of where we've got up to until now. Um, given that we're kind of mid-flight, still a relatively small application, given that we've only been at it for a few weeks, um, but it will allow you to see these ideas in development. So I'll just introduce you to the application. So when we started designing, can everyone see that? Yep. So what we have in this application is the central core, which is a, wor a workflow. Um, we take a document um, that the a user submits, and then certain stages can happen to it, certain things can happen to it through this workflow. It's a business process that we're modeling. We then have all of the integrations that come around it. So we have several user interfaces, integration with an external system that we call SITS, um, and then some notifications that go out, um, SMSs and emails primarily. Um, and then we add in all the data flows. Whoa. So what you're seeing there is where we expect things to move through the system. Don't worry about it too much. So we have our core or logic domain. This is the workflow, the system that we're modeling. And just to give you a very quick overview of what the process is, um, we have our business process, which is a workflow. We create a document. Somebody then reviews the document. They approve it or reject it. If it's approved, it's then inserted into this external system SITS. And that's the workflow at a simplified level where we've got up to so far. You'll notice I have not mentioned the user interface in that workflow. It's a series of tasks that need to be performed on this document, but there's no kind of talk about how the, how the user is going to access it, how, what they're going to do. This is a separate thing. 
when you're designing this kind of system, you can drill down. So we saw before uh, this, kind of the full system at large. We can now see, drill down into this central section and see how it integrates with the world. And that's what this is. This is the workflow, the workflow domain and its integration points. So here we have uh, kind of requests coming in to change things or to get data. And you can see the, some, something of the internals of how this thing is implemented. It's an event processor. So any questions so far? Doing all right? Keeping up? Yes? That's an excellent question. So what you're seeing here is uh, an artifact of, uh, we developed this too fast, slightly too fast. So this, you're right, should be a separate thing. You should be integrating with this a little bit more, more properly. In the diagram, um, you're seeing the way we kind of thought about it at first. Um, in the actual system, we're using GORM to talk to Mongo, and so you can see that as an integration. But it's an excellent question, why is Mongo there? I always ask that kind of right at the start, and just have updated the diagrams. So thank you. Um, apart from this, we then have a user interface domain. So you saw this in the original diagram. Uh, it's this one, academic UI. This is a user interface that's optimized for a particular uh, class of user. And again, we can drill down into this domain and see how it integrates with the users and the world. Now, given that we're talking about integration points, and we're actually talking about users, you start to think about how does my user integrate with this process, with this, with this domain. Now, you'll see that there's no mention of the data here. You start to think about how the user interacts. What tasks does the user want to perform with this system? Not what data do they want. That's a completely separate thing. That's, that's an implementation detail. And so this very much forces you to build task-based UIs. You can't, um, if you're kind of applying this process, you can't create a data-centric user interface this way. Um, you have to create a task-based user interface, which many studies show is kind of a superior user experience than, than data. So, to the code. Right, I have a fair amount of code to show you, so um, if I kind of, uh, if anything's not clear, please throw your hand up, stop me, ask a question. Right, let's get this set up. Okay. Right, so first thing that you'll see, you can see that? Everyone see that okay? Yep. First thing you'll see is in my original diagram, um, I had the separate domains of the application. Now they're mapping directly to packages, to, to, to kind of Java, standard Java packages. And this kind of starts to answer the question, what package should I put my code in? Kind of this immediately gives me somewhere to do that. So first off, we can go into the workflow. You'll notice that there's no user interface code, no controllers. Let's step into there. I do not have a, user, a um, workflow controller of any kind. Instead, I have a set of Groovy code. And in here, I have a workflow, which is an interface. So we were talking about events before and how using events changes your communication. Now, I don't have an event bus. I do not have any kind of uh, eventing infrastructure. All I've got is a different communication style. So you'll notice these methods. These methods are all in the past tense. They're saying that something has happened. Um, and then they send in a piece of data. 
Now, that data is an event that's, that has happened. And this is eventing in its simplest form. You're saying, this has happened, and then try and pass me back an event saying what you've done. And it's, it's as simple as that. This is eventing at its simplest level. OK. Right, so this workflow is the, um, the kind of the public face of the workflow domain, this workflow interface. So nothing behind this will ever make it through. So if you were to talk yesterday, um, we talked about a, a domain transformer. This is something that will make sure that no types from one domain will make it into another. This is what's happening here. So when I say my save propose, uh, module proposal saved, this is saying that the user has submitted a, doc a document and saying, I want this saved. So we step into that event. That contains some information from the user, which is this class here. So this event is carrying some user-generated information. So this, this kind of uh, class here, you would say this looks very much like a domain class. Uh, and it is to an extent. It's a, it's a kind of a record that the user wants saving. This is not what goes into the database. There's another class that looks kind of similar to this, um, but it's different again. It does a different job. And I will show you that. Okay, so in my workflow, we can step through and find the actual implementing service. So you saw in the, uh, in the original diagram, um, we had a, an event processor. So this is something that will receive an event, find a command to execute against that event, and then execute that command and pass an event back. This is what, what it turned into. So instead of having a, a separate event processor, we had a service that finds a, a, an implementation and passes the event through. So here, we have an event, an event coming in for the save. Hold up time. We have an event coming in from the save. That gets passed into the processor, which is this imp implementation here. Here you see we have our uh, event coming in. We do a, in this case, it's a save. So we're finding the correct ID, finding the, data, finding the database generated code. Oh, sorry, finding the uh, appropriate domain from the database. Loading it, doing some stuff, sending an event back. All fairly, fairly straightforward. OK. So, kind of going back to this interface, you'll notice, you'll notice what we've got here is uh, very few signatures. So there's, there's no kind of defs or anything like that here. This is the barrier uh, behind which everything in your core domain is happening. And so you need to know exactly what, what goes in and what comes out. And this is then your communication. Okay. Right, so I'll show you a test. Now, given that this doesn't have any UI, you can just do unit tests. So here you can see a unit test for this, for this particular um, event going in. And we have our service. You send an event in, get a response, check the response is correct. And then you also test inside the domain what's happening. In this case, we want to make sure when we send an event in saying the user wants this saved, um, then the actual save has happened. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Everyone okay? I realize this is a fair amount of code, so it was a, uh, of it wasn't time to trim down properly. <laughs> okay, okay. Right, so. There we go. That's the, uh, the, propose, well, the, uh, the workflow. It's just events going in, events coming out, things happening inside there. But it's all kind of past tense. I want this. I, this, is, this has happened. Do something. And so the, uh, the, kind of the, the decision-making process is different. So in this case, we have a decision-making process happening inside the workflow domain. The event can come in saying the user has saved this. It's then up to the workflow to react to that. It can say, yes, that's OK. I'll save it. Or it can respond the re response back. No, this is not. This is not going to happen. The decision is, is inside the workflow. Question. Uh, 
that's a great question. Uh, yes, it is for testing is the quick answer. Um, I'm going to come to that in just a moment. Right, so moving on to the academic UI. So here, this does have a, a, a kind of user interface because that's what it is. That's all it is. Now, if any of you have seen any of my talks previously um, on Grails, and you come with deep, deep love for command objects. Um, I think command objects are one of the best pieces of, of, of Grails. Um, and so given that uh, kind of the diagram we saw before, um, you, applying a hexagonal style architecture, you're led very much towards task-based user interfaces. Um, you have to then model that in your code. So one of the easiest ways to model that in Grails is using a command object. So we're here we have a controller. Uh, we'll find the save. So this is the save action here. So a user will come to this um, when they want to save a document. They'll have written it and they want to save it. Now you'll see in here that I'm using a command object to model that task. Um, there are no services referenced in this, in this controller. Uh, instead what I'm doing is wrapping all of the logic to do with accepting that user request, processing it correctly, validating it, all of that, um, is all in the command object. And so that allows you to separate in a very clean way um, kind of the different concerns that are going on here. So in this case, we have a controller and nothing else. That's its only job. Uh, we have our command object, if we step into it, that is accepting all of the data from the user. Um, it's then creating an event and pushing it into the workflow service with all the correct data. So its job is to accept the data from the user, marshal it, and push it towards the workflow, and then handle the, handle the result. And so we've got a very, uh, very clean separation of concerns going on. Uh, yeah. So in looking at the diagram before, um, you'll see all the different ports around, all the different integration points. Every one of those in that diagram is mapped as a, as a command object and then given a URL um, by this controller. So this has some interesting effects as far as testing go, which I'll just very quickly show you. So our to pick a command, so in this case, save module proposal. This doesn't need to, to consider requests or HTTP in any way. There we go. So kind of all the HTTP uh, interaction is completely removed. We're not thinking about that at all when we're testing what's going on. Um, instead, all the HTTP interaction is in the controller. And given that all of the business logic to do with uh, marshalling the data and sending the correct event has, is in the command object, in the controller test, we don't need to think about that either. And so our uh, kind of module controller spec becomes very simple. It's just, if, if the event goes in correctly, test that this has happened. If the event has not gone incorrectly, test that this has happened, and that's what you can see here. The tests are reduced to something really quite trivial. Okay. Right, now, there was an excellent question uh, about why do we have multiple implementations of the workflow service, and I'm gonna show you that right now. So in my service, if I can find it, I have deliberately crippled a couple, of the, uh, a couple of the integrations. So when I access this service, it's going to break. So I will now do that. So I say this is a very, um, Sorry, I wasn't doing this earlier. Apologies, given that it's a, an in-development application. Right, so I'll start the application and show you this failing, and then show you what this switch to using events actually allows you to do. This focus on communication 
um, changes the kind of the capabilities of your application in really quite interesting ways, um, apart from simplifying testing. Okay, so we'll go through this. Come on. Thinking. Brilliant. Okay. Right, so now this is a fairly straightforward application. As you can see, it's got no fancy skin on it. This is not how it will look in the end. Um, but we've only been at it for a few weeks. Apologies. Um, what you can see here is um, some of these documents that we were talking about before. Um, it's got a Mongo database ID. Um, you can go into it. Um, see what's going on in here, save it, that's fine. Um, I crippled the submission, so first we go to review, and then we submit. And that's no good. You now this is, I can't develop my user interface. You know, I, I, I want to develop my user interface, the workflow is not complete, I need to go and implement the workflow first. This doesn't seem very good. However, given that we've switched um, to using communication rather than kind of this imperative style. Um, I don't need the workflow to be complete functionally. I only need something there that speaks as though it was. Something that responds in the correct way. And given that we've defined our communication very closely, very, very, it's very constrained what this communication is, I can then create something else that communicates in the but has no implementation, no functional implementation behind it. So it's a, a runtime stub, if you were. Now this is possible because we're using an eventing style. Because we've got a very controlled kind of Im implementation, um, very controlled integration based on communication. So we have our, this is the real implementation of the workflow service. It was noted, there is a another implementation, which is a stub, and this is it. So this accepts the communication in and returns some pre-canned events out. Um, that does. So it gives a well-known set of events coming in, anything coming in. Now this allows you to, once this is in place, it allows you to develop your user interface, develop any of the other you know, the domain system Now, the reason there were three, uh, I'm actually using uh, a proxy here that allows me to change it at runtime. So here we have a, um, the proxy that's wired in as service. So this is in the Spring configuration. This is what is workflow service. And then it has a changeable delegate. So at runtime, the default is the live one. And that's what I'll do now. So you'll see this, this proposal failed. This submission failed. It didn't work. I can now change it to, no, not six. Here we go. Quick little, so I have a little controller, a little Grails controller that, that sees all the proxies and can tell you what's going on. So in this case, we're using the live versions of all the domains. If I want to switch to a workflow stub, we do that. There we go, I'm now using a stub workflow. And we can see the results. You'll notice the Mongo database identifiers are gone. We're no longer talking to anything that's, that's persisting. We're no longer talking to anything that has any real functionality. It's just the stub. There's nothing else there. It's just, it knows how to speak the language, but doesn't do anything. So we can click into this. We're getting data back. All the events are flowing back correctly. We can submit. We see the review again. This failed before, but now it works. Because the stub that's behind, because the, the workflow that I've now substituted knows how to speak the language. So what else can this do? Well, you may have noticed in my stub, I was actually storing all the events coming in. So when somebody sends an event into the workflow, it's recorded. 
Now, given that you've recorded, recorded these events coming, going in, you can replay which we'll do. So I actually, in my controller, uh, I actually have a way of retrieving all of these events. So you can see everything that's gone into the system. So there's loads. We're interested in the submission. You can actually find that here. So we have a submission that went into the system, an event saying, I'm submitting this document, and that's there. Given that we can create this stub, speaks, speaks language, but doesn't have any functionality, we can control it, like, say, in a test. And so this gives some fabulous effects for testing. So, for example, if you want to have a functional test, but you don't care about the actual persistence, you just want to make sure that your user interface works, not and how it communicates with the workflow. You don't care about the workflow itself. You can do that very easily, as I've done right now. So I've disconnected my real workflow, put in a runtime stub, and now I can test just the user interface. I don't care what's going on, going on, my, going on in Mongo, because nothing will be. And so in my tests, I'll show you a test for the academic UI, functional test. No, don't want to do that. So here we have a test. So who's used Jeb? Not many? OK, don't worry about this then. Um, but it's, this is a Jeb test. So this is a, a way of using Selenium, uh, given a nice UI. Uh, it doesn't use any bits of Jeb. All this is saying, proposal page, uh, using a browser, some title, some information into the page, page, the, um, the workflow, just using a URL. So in this case, I'm getting my workflow. Oh, just this. In this case, it makes sure that we are actually having a save proposal event going into the workflow. So if through the UI, submit, check that the communication that we expected to happen has happened. We don't check that anything's been persisted. We only check the communication. Any questions so far? Everyone, I realize we've gone through a, gone through a lot of stuff. Okay. Yep. Right, so as far as code goes, that's all I wanted to show you. Um, I will quickly flip back to presentation. Okay, okay. Um, so the question then, once if you do this, if you actually apply this as a way of building your systems, what else can you do? What can you do next? Um, what you're seeing here is, a, is an application that's been built in this structured way. Apply this, it's had this architecture applied to it. Um, what you can do next, given that you've got all of these domains in your application, um, you can split the domains into separate plugins. Um, and that's what we're planning to do. So we're not quite there yet. That's, this is what we tend to do in, when we apply this architecture. Um, first, develop the application as a single blob, but well, with well-structured communication. Next thing, break them into plugins. Allow them to develop at their own rate. All they're doing is communicating with each other using events. So you need these uh, interfaces, uh, assuming you're doing eventing in the same style as me. Uh, that's all you need is these interfaces. And then some pre-canned in-out events. <coughs> Um, next thing, if you were to follow, say, how, how Jeff's doing things, um, split your domains into microservices. Um, using eventing, this becomes possible. This becomes easy. Once you control how these things communicate with each other, 
then your options are open. Um, so, blatant promo. There is actually a, a conference uh, in London um, near the end of the year on microservices, um, which takes these ideas all the way to their logical conclusion. Having these interoperating bits of the system communicating with each other, each bit of the system focused on one single task. So I uh, recommend you have a quick look, see if, you, see if you like the idea of the conference, come along to it. It's uh, being organized by Skills Matter uh, in London. So any questions? Everyone's in shock. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I am too. <laughs> Question. If you have an existing, existing Rails app, how hard would it be to uh, apply this pattern? Yes, yes. So the question is, if you have an existing Rails application, how hard would it be to move towards this? Um, the answer is fairly. Um, the approach that I've taken in the past um, is to take your existing application and treat it as a domain, um, and then slowly pull things out of it. So any new additions you want to make in terms of function, functional areas, you create new domains and, and control their interaction with the existing portion, um, and then slowly try to tease them apart over time. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to do because you will be you will naturally kind of, it's, it's part of the same, part of things we were describing at the start, naturally things will be quite interwoven. Um, so breaking them apart is, it requires time and effort. Um, so it will be fairly hard, depending on how large the application is. But I have done it before and it, and it can be done. Any other questions? That's an excellent question. So uh, the question is, um, I have an, ev an event going into the system which is saved has happened. Um, how can I then justify responding to that, possibly with a negative? Um, the answer is possibly it's, it's slightly misnamed. It's the user has requested a save, um, which then has a valid response of no, go away, you're not allowed. Um, but yes, kind of, it's part of this communication thing kind of having your communication well specified. Um, and I think that's, that's, I did notice that when I was preparing the talk actually, so uh, thank you. Um, it's, it's the thing, when you have to specify your communication very tightly um, based on the, in this case, the user has requested something. Good question. Anything else? Thank you very much. <laughs>